we have Shayla Livingston with us again today, and um, I know that in the context of our visit with the medical dispensary in Milton, we had had some committee conversation about who is it that reviews um, the food production part of a dispensary. Um, and so I've asked Shayla to come back and spend some time with us this afternoon. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I apologize, I ran away the other day. Shayla Livingston from the health department. Um, so I thought maybe it would be helpful just very briefly to back up because I know now it's been spread over four weeks that we've been talking about this. So the health department um, is our food inspectors inspect licensed food manufacturers, licensed food service, so that, that's what you think of as restaurants, and lodging. Um, and they use model FDA food code, so Food and Drug Administration food codes to do that um, work. We use our Department of Health State Laboratory um, to work with them when they do their inspections. I think I've said it before, but I'll just say it again, that that program is currently seriously understaffed and underfunded, and there's 11 of them in the national regs where they make recommendations for how many inspectors per institutions based on their estimation there should be 20. Um, so that group and that program is very worried about this new project because for them it feels like starting an entirely new program. They do not inspect um, the, the product, they do not test for things like the solvents and the pesticides, they do not have any expertise or any federal standards to use in order to consider THC content within an edible. Um, and the health department, I think, which is where this program sits as a whole, has been very vocal that we are opposed to edibles and, and opposed to selling edibles in Vermont. Um, so that's just sort of the, the health department. We're not excited or interested in doing this work part of it and would need a lot of resources and more people and more money and more lead time to do it. The flip side, which we didn't have when we very first came to you, is that we've now had more in-depth conversations with the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. And they are both, there's a bill that's before, I don't know, in the House or the Senate, about hemp production, and they are working actively on regulations for CBD and hemp production in Vermont. And they are already starting up this type of program for this same plant that would do these same tests for solvents and metals and pesticides, and again regulate this um, this product for human consumption. They also do food safety and food inspection work. Um, that work is split between the federal and state governments, as well as health and agriculture in many different configurations. Um, and Karen from and can tell you a little bit more about what they do already and how they have the expertise that it would take and need to do this work. In terms of efficiency and effectiveness, um, uh, what has been found in terms of recalls in other states have almost all been related to the product, the, to the THC cannabis product itself, involving pesticides and, and other solvents and things that come from the plant. So if we're looking to other states for what is the most risky part of this process and the thing that we are, would be the most concerned about is really in the purview of ag, and they would have a better capacity and ability to look for that. Whereas we actually probably wouldn't at all ever do that. Um, and then lastly, I think uh, what's important is if we did it, if we did this at the health department, we would have two different departments and agencies doing very, very similar work for very similar products in terms of food safety, and that doesn't make sense. And again, I'm sorry I didn't have that information the first time we came to you, so it sort of sounded 
even more like we're just complaining, and I don't like to do that, but it, it does make more sense from an efficiency perspective to do it in this manner. We have had requests from the medical marijuana industry to come in and inspect our kitchens, and that has been a constant thing, and that part of their looking for the legitimacy, the legitimacy of having the health department seal of approval on what they're doing. On the one hand, we really appreciate that, but they're looking at food safety and taking that very seriously, and I think that some of them very, very much are. Um, those food model food codes are online. Um, they are accessible to the public. Um, I know that I've had a conversation with Shane. I know that they come up with those. Um, we would not be leaving ag out there on a limb by themselves alone. That's not how we work with them. We work very closely with ag, and we would, of course, support them in any way that they need it. Um, for example, when there are foodborne illness outbreaks, we often work together already. So it's not that we would never touch it or that we would never support them. Um, it's rather who is the lead and who's the one responsible for the regulation and inspection aspects of this program. So hopefully that was a more comprehensive, consolidated version of this request. So if the health department goes into a dispensary today because they were asked to look at some of their procedures and stuff. Mm -hmm. And you saw something that was a problem. What you do? That's a good question. And I don't um, have an immediate answer for you. I need to check with our lawyer. We do have the authority to to go in in any public health emergency. So if there was not a public health emergency or something that looked like it could become that, I think we almost always have the ability to write a, a public health. Um, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Not thinking of the word. Order. And we could go in and, and So you would do still something. have some ability? But we wouldn't necessarily, yeah, I don't know if we would have, I'd have to, what I'd have to check on okay. is whether we'd have the authority to shut them down or not right now. Um, because the way that we shut down a restaurant is through a licensing um, authority. Right, no license, no. Right. No, no. Ag has okay. that same authority that we have for meat and dairy and eggs and <laughs> other products of that nature. Um, so it's that license, it's that when the, when the Canvas Board would create this license, that would be a piece of it. Um, is that you would have to get a license from X agency to do this food production or food manufacturing process. But I would have to get back to you on exactly how we would address that under the current statutes. Yeah, no, I guess my point is we don't want you to turn a blind eye. Well, that's not ours. I mean, right. But um, we, we really do that at the health department. Well, we're not, we're I, normally not into under-regulation. I, 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 I also appreciate your comment about efficiency and how many people do we have to, with the same eyes and the same issues looking at an establishment, which begs the question why we continue in retail of having the health department look at the mm -hmm. deli mm -hmm. and then next to the deli is the meat mm -hmm. department. We have the mm -hmm. meat inspector going around in their own cars um, and burning their own gas, um, uh, inspecting yeah. similar things. If I could fix the federal government, I'd have a lot of things that could be on the list. <laughs> <laughs> Some things you could fix at the state level. Some things we can fix at the state level. That one, that one has a federal um, origin, though. But yes, I agree with you. So if the health department were to have sufficient resources to <coughs> inspect um, production facilities of cannabis product, what might that cost? We don't know because we don't understand the quantity of licensees this would be, the quantity of product. I mean, one of the pieces that is very concerning to a program is, again, this feeling that we're already so under-resourced and we don't have the concept of what this would look like, how long we'll have. So we don't, I don't have an answer for you for that. We would probably be on the same FDA ratios, and I could get those for you so you could see what the ratio of inspector to institution is, and I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, but I'm assuming that's how the program would work from it um, in order to tell you what it would entail. Uh, but again, it would depend on how many of these institutions there were. So I, are you proposing we set up something where from a food safety inspection and licensing standpoint, that that 
for cannabis facilities that refers to the Agency of Agriculture. Would you be open to um, some type of wording in consultation um, with the health department? Yeah. In inspection. <laughs> <laughs> I have to work with Michelle on that particular. <laughs> yes. But absolutely, we would be very much open to being consulted and would happily provide that. And we'd probably do it anyway. Rob and then John. So you've made it quite clear <clears throat> that the health department doesn't have the capability and in some cases the interest to do this, but with the agricultural department, I mean, if they go into a facility that is uh, making food products, how different are their audits than yours? I mean, right, like what's the what's the gap that would have to be filled? Yeah. Can I phone a friend? Um, sure. <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. that, is that okay then? It really it depends. depends. Side so it really uh, depends. Um, we are in meat meat production facilities every day and they can't operate unless our inspectors are there. Uh, we inspect every carcass, we inspect every, that we do have facilities, meat and milk in particular, that can't operate unless the agency inspector is on site. Um, to produce, to produce a dairy, if you're a dairy processor, um, anybody, the dispensaries are dairy processors now, um, since you, I don't know if you've heard the testimony about the moldy butter. Um, since this was something that was regulated wholly under DPS, we were aware that the dispensaries were processing dairy products. As soon as we found out through those moldy butter complaints, we got those facilities licensed to produce dairy products. Any creamy stand, um, anyone making creamies and selling in the summer is licensed as a dairy producer as well. Those inspections are, are similar to what the health department does. We come in, look at temperature, look at sanitary conditions, do swabs and tests. And that's not every, you don't have, we don't have an inspector on the premise every day, but we do inspect. So based on your knowledge and I guess what you would anticipate what has to happen, do you have the in-house capability to, to do? So we're building, that, we're building that for hemp and CBD infused products right now. Um, if the size of the retail tax and regulate market is yet unknown. Um, but it could utilize some of the resources that were devoted to the health industry. Um, just to follow up on what Shayla was saying, on any food product, there's that hazard analysis piece and we, we the, it's called a HACCP plan if you're talking about meat, but it's hazard analysis, critical control point. Um, we swap carcasses because that's most likely to find out where the salmonella E. coli would be. Um, with cannabis products, what we're seeing across the country at this point is all of those recalls are due to um, pesticide residues. So, we would establish a critical control point initially that involved testing for pesticide residues. Second is residual solid in the extraction process. Um, and our lab is currently set up to do that, and we are doing that for, for the extracted CBD products. Um, can't tell you what we need for resources. I broke this down for 241 like five years ago at the original shop at this. And I think we were looking mostly at uh, a one field inspector and uh, two chemist position that would phase in with the <coughs> with the development and scaling of the tax and regulatory system. Um, so the health department regulates bakeries, correct? Yeah. Um, and bakeries required to be licensed. Yeah. So if a cannabis producer is baking cookies, shouldn't they have to be licensed by the Department of Health? So what we're saying is that we think that the, the Department of Ag is 
able to do the food safety piece of it and is much more capable of doing the THC cannabis aspect of it? Well, I'm not talking about the can, I'm talking about the cookies. <coughs> so we couldn't we couldn't inspect a cannabis edible separate from the cannabis content. So this is something I actually said took me a while to understand with our inspectors. They they are not, that the way that they do their inspections, they couldn't say, okay, you're, this is a product is safe to eat because, because they have to be able to say that about the whole product and that that contains cannabis and they don't have the capacity to regulate that. I hear what you're saying in terms of did you keep the butter at the correct temperature before you, and I'm sorry, I don't actually know the details about how you inspect a bakery, but did you do all those steps correctly Yes, they could do that, but they would never want to license that place as saying it's food safe because they can't, they cannot tell you that it is based on their expertise. Well, what if I decide to put in my cookies a new ingredient, kombucha or, or something like that? Are you going to tell me you're not going to license that? So, no, that's a very good question. They have um, very specific lists of what is and is not considered a food, an, an okay thing to add to food and food additive. Um, so kombucha is considered an acceptable thing to sell for human consumption and is an okay food additive. Um, cannabis is because it's federally illegal, it's not and and is not considered right now um, by the food inspection community a, a a food additive. And so no, it's a really good question. Yes. So new ingredients, there are standards and there are lists, and this cannabis is not on that list. That's because of the federal. Uh, I think it's that, and I, I can't tell you all the reasons, but yeah, it's not it's not considered an, an acceptable food additive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a couple of friends of mine have uh, set up whole in-home um, industry, small industries where they make food products, yeah. not with cannabis, yeah. but food yeah. products. Um, so initially, before they got started, when they maybe contacted the health department for a license, mm -hmm. there was an initial inspection yeah. of the premises. Yeah. Nothing to do really with the food that was being made, but yeah. do they have right. water? Is it clean? Et cetera, et cetera. There's quite, quite a long list. Yes. Fridge, right. yep. So is that something that, in my mind, is what the role that I was thinking of for the health department was to inspect the premises periodically to make sure that it's clean, like you would do for a restaurant, not necessarily the food. Is that possible? And do so I have the? Am I misunderstanding? You are. Mind? Your understanding is excellent, and the, the agency of agriculture does that as well for their so for the creamy stand that he just described. That is also what they do there. So it is the same function, but they could do the whole kit and caboodle, whereas we would just be doing, you'd be sending two different people in instead of one person in. How often do you um, review restaurants? How often do you inspect them? Is that an annual thing? Or ideally, it's about every 14 months. Yeah, okay. that's right. Okay. It's between one and <laughs> two right. years, is what I want to say. Okay. So, but yes, the chair might know better. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Unless there's a complaint. Mm -hmm. Right. I do. Uh, Carrie, based on what you've heard, is there any part of the seed to sale process that you can't do currently or couldn't be able to do with some slight modification? That's the, uh, and that's what I spoke earlier about the, the house and the structure. <laughs> Um, the retail inspection side, um, we only have authority to stop sale, not the um, sting operation that the alcohol, uh, ate the liquor and lottery do. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to find somebody violating the marriage, it's it's so it was part of, it was part of the co that. If we were to find somebody violating the sales to an underage individual, we could stop sale them or essentially pull a license, but we don't have the authority to bring a criminal. Mm -hmm. But up 
to that, you could handle everything from the sea to if I've got a sale, if there's no underage person on the outside the county, sure. that could be within your purview. Yes, and we've outlined, we've outlined um, this for the Governor's Commission uh, in the past. Um, and that includes the environmental piece, the nutrient management plans, the pesticide use, outdoor or indoor pesticide use, as well as disposing of waste nutrient, whether that's a fertilizer or other soil environment. Thank you, Any other questions for these five people today? Um, to answer your question a little bit, some of our CBD producers are currently using already established commercial kitchens. Mm -hmm. um, and it may or may not cause the licensure of that commercial kitchen to fall into, into question. But I know a lot of the folks producing these uh, CBD infused products are currently using restaurants or commercial kitchens. And it's still a gray area, and we've chatted about that um, extensively. So they're using the rest uh, kitchen at an already established. Correct, place. and they do that sometimes with pet foods as well, and that's another gray area because you're bringing a class D meat into a food. Interesting. So we do overlap, and we <laughs> talk all the time. Mm -hmm. They use them for pet food. Mm -hmm. And and just to be very clear, I think that. Um, one piece that we're very worried about is not having that kind of cross-contamination with THC. Mm -hmm. And CBD, as, as Gary said, like, we want to work on that and sort of figure that out and, and make sure that it's clear, but with THC, we never want that to be gray. And you have been very productive this weekend in incorporating some of the suggested changes that we have been working on here. I've got a few things for y'all to take a look at. Now you've got somebody at two? Uh, we have you at two. Oh. So we well, don't need to switch gears until three o'clock. We don't. Oh, okay. You don't have to use all that time. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I think it's really going to be up to you, actually, on how much of that time I need to use. <laughs> um, I hope you got some time to spend with your kids. I did, but you know, they also they 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 know the drill, which is like we just start doing a countdown, which is like this is the time of year. Year. So and then uh, and then I. <laughs> so I'm just gonna go right to the highlighted portions if I'm not gonna there's sometimes little highlight portions that are just me changing a reference or things like that I'm just not gonna do that I'm just really gonna go to the stuff and stuff if that's okay with y'all and also let you know that there's a, a few things that like on the decision points around like the integrated license where if you guys are okay with that and the concept there, on the next draft I'll go back and put all the cross references. I didn't, sometimes I don't pull it all the way through just in case you don't stick with that decision and you wanna go somewhere else. Um, so, uh, so for the record, Michelle Childs, Office of Legislative Counsel, I'm looking at draft 3.3 um, dated today for S54. Um, the, uh, the first change, and this one actually is just a technical, but I just want to talk about it just for a minute. And this is on the definition of public place. So if you recall when we talked about the bill originally, so last year in H511, it prohibited consumption of cannabis in a public place. And this definition is currently in Title 18 where you have your 
marijuana laws, the criminal laws, the civil laws, um, and uh, public place is a very expansive definition. And so it's any place you would generally think of. It, it also includes any place of public accommodation. And then in addition to that, it's any place that you can't smoke a cigarette or vape. So and those are sometimes places that are not public accommodations. It might be a private office, but yet it might fall under this definition under the smoke-free law. So it's pretty, it's pretty broad. And so this is the definition that's in current law. But the highlighted language on line two on page three is that it, there's a reference, um, the reference is to the definition of the to, of tobacco substitute. Not that that's not helpful, but I think it's more, it's better if it's referencing um, the phrase, any place where the use or possession of a light tobacco product, to, um, tobacco product or tobacco substitute is prohibited by law pursuant to, and that's the chapter. And so it's important because that other definition where it's just saying, here's the definition of tobacco substitute is in Title Seven, And this is referring you to the actual chapter where they prohibit, where the, the locations where they prohibit smoking. And so I just thought that that was a better technical tweak and I just wanted to point it out too because I know there there's a, tends to be still a lot of confusion about um, where you can use cannabis. Um, next change is page seven. This is on the advisory committee. So I didn't change composition in any way, but I added the sentence on lines 15 and 16 Section shall not be construed to limit the board in any way with regard to who it may consult with in an effort to execute its duties. So just trying to little belts and suspenders to make it clear that anybody who's not listed there doesn't mean they can't, the board can't bring them in, talk to them, sit them on an advisory committee or such. the report to the legislature in next January. And one thing that y'all discussed at the last markup was to ask them to report on whether money's collected pursuant to the local option tax should be shared with the municipalities that don't, that have a licensed cannabis retailer, but it isn't a, a uh, I mean, have a licensed cannabis establishment that's not a retailer. So whether there should be some revenue sharing, that's not the way that it's set up currently. Um, and so they think the board would report back in January on that. Next is going into the cannabis establishments chapter. I just go back to that one. What does that mean for a uh, dispensary that is taking advantage of the um, temporary license. Do, do, does the town that that dispensary is located in receive any local option tax? Well, this draft no longer contemplates temporary licenses. You guys we, we changed the name or something. Oh, you do an integrated license, like a vertical license right. for one. And so um, that would um, be as every if everybody is good with this, the way that it would the way that the retail tax works is it's attached to retail and so it would be wherever that wherever that integrated license point of sale is located. Okay, but it would only obviously be on some proceeds would be under medical. No, it would be under the retail, un under the commercial system. Yep. Just not on medical sales, but on retail sales that they made by the medical establishment. Yep. So we're not collecting the checks. Uh, and the, the option tax itself is something the municipality would have to vote on, right? Whether it's an option tax, or is the option tax there instantly to? Two percent we talked about. The two percent. It's already so so how would they then decide to divvy that up? Would it be up to the local community's collecting the option? I mean how do they divvy up the Yeah, when you're so, talking about sharing it, who's you're gonna leave this up to the board? Is that 
Well, right now is is that it it goes the tax department does it and then it goes back out to the towns that collected it. Is but I, my understanding was and I wasn't here for the conversation, but I, I y'all directed me later to that, that I think JP maybe made a suggestion or somebody made a suggestion about what about some type of revenue sharing with the towns that have a cannabis establishment that's not a retailer mm -hmm. and shouldn't they maybe get some of the, the local option money and my understanding is there wasn't agreement on a certain policy thing and that you guys decided to have the board come back and and recommend something and if they, you know and what that might look like well, of how they would divvy that up I'm quite the next amount of dollars in option tax and currently the way this reads is that often tax goes back to the one town. But what you're saying is with this change is someone's going to make a decision that the town will get this much because they have a retail option tax and then the other will be given to where the, the other non-retail stores are? Right. This is a report back, but that was my understanding. I'm just looking at more growers than I do retailers. Right, I think it's complex because you have to think about, well, you know, uh, how many okay, other cannabis well, establishments does a town have and what type of establishments do they have and, you know, for, and what's the impact of, on the town of those establishments. And so it's a, trying to come up with a formula for how you do that revenue sharing if not, they're not all collecting the tax. Yeah, and it's not their town, it's another town over. You know, it's how, how do you get one town to say, I'm going to give up X? This town over here, but you're saying well, I don't think it would go from this town to that town. I think it all go back to the tax department. There would be a formula for how they then redistribute that to, where in that the to any of the towns that have some type of. So it may be that if you have, um, you know, there's some kind of formula. You get this percentage if you have a tier one through tier <coughs> three cultivator. You get this much, you know, and then they come up with some kind of plan. Yeah, but so, so it's just not for the retailer. The option. Right. The way that it is currently is that it's just for we, you know, retailers collect it in the town. It goes back to the town in which the retailer. But this would change that. So this not. wouldn't change it. This would have the board come back and report to you whether money's collected pursuant should be shared. So a recommendation from them of whether there should be revenue sharing with other towns. <laughs> and if they do recommend that they're sharing with other towns, what would that kind of formula, what would that possibly look like? So just so that we're all clear on what this process looks like, this is directing the board to come back <coughs> with a recommendation on whether towns that have just a dispensary or just a grow operation or just a manufacturer, whether they should also um, get a little bit of that revenue back from the local option. It doesn't guarantee that they do. It, we're not setting in stone what what that sharing rate is going to be. And even when the board comes back and makes that recommendation, the legislature has to enact that because we have to actually pass the law. So this is prompting the board to say, hey, some towns who don't have a retail establishment might still have other cannabis establishments and might benefit from some of the revenue share. And then it'll be up to the legislature to figure that out. John? No, not to complicate things, but I thought, and Marsha's probably more expertise on this, is, you know, we talked about how towns and state share licensing fees for alcohol. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought, that's where we're going with this language, um, is that there be a split. But the local option tax, you know, would go to the towns where it's collected. Um, but that the licensing fee could be split, you know, for, you know, growers and other licenses that are not retail licenses. A portion of that, like with alcohol, could go to towns that host a, a grower. But that's not what he says. Jim? I think John is correct. That's what we were talking about. <laughs> what I threw out there is <laughs> uh, But I don't have any problem of putting it in here and also um, putting it in the uh, license fee area. It, it's all 
difficult it is is it's like the local option tax now, 30% is retained by the state. And it's giving back through the pilot program. Mm -hmm. We come up with something similar to that on the 2%. We would have to um, okay that next year. Or whenever they came back with a suggestion, or we do nothing and just leave it as it is. I don't I don't see any harm in putting this language in and or putting it in with the license fee and it may be we settle on one or the other and not both. So JP, this conversation is coming about because of an idea that you sparked in, in committee. So I'm just wondering if you have a, a sense of whether your conception of this was on sharing the fees, the application fees, or was your concept on sharing between municipalities on the local option. My, my take on my request on this was to, to receive uh, revenue from the production of the marijuana grown for retail purposes, which obviously would have to be kept separate from the medical grown. And then and then a that didn't meet a whole lot of support, but then a, a uh, op, an option was come up some, some by Marsha similar to what the LC has done. Mm -hmm. Where the at least the municipality might get a portion of the of the uh, license fee. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. you know that's better than nothing. But obviously my job as a representative of for Milton and in, in that we have a large dispensary in our town. My job is to represent Milton and to see that we if this law passes that maybe we can get a Share of the revenue from that. So I'm still, you know, trying to get some tax, well, tax does, relief. Does this and this, this is a good start. And this is, this to me is something that I like to see this. And it, it does allow the marijuana control board to review it. And, and what you said, uh, if they do recommend, then it comes back to the legislature for, for uh, further action, which is pretty much what I'm looking for. So, you know, I'm fairly content on what I'm hearing today. That's why this is up, and I think it's what I was initially looking for. Mm -hmm. How? I just have a minor critique in line 20. It seems after there's so a recommended formula for sharing the revenue. Is that missing a verb? Is it a formula for sharing the revenue is recommended? Or doesn't quite flow. Sort of a fragment. Otherwise. But I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at it. Okay. Just seems like it's missing something. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't here for any discussion about sharing license fees. So if that's something you want, then I need somebody to touch base with me about what that might look like. I would also just. Just as a reminder, um, you have a giant hole in your cannabis regulation fund. Um, it is only, the only monies in there are your license fees. Um, not that you can't then dedicate some of them to go back out somewhere else, but one of the issues is that you're having a hard time, it's very up in the air about whether or not your license fees are going to be able to sustain the board. So anytime you say we're going to then take a piece of license fees and send them somewhere else, so you, just a wanna, point. So you just want to re remember that. Things that it doesn't include. Um, so 
so it doesn't include labels affixed to any cannabis or cannabis products. It doesn't cover any editorials. Um, I guess maybe I should go slower since you guys Yeah, it's the, or in any other media, uh, I just know that social media will be burned with this. So the question is, is, is that what we are looking to do is prevent social media from putting up where these places are and like the ones we looked at but actually advertise what they were selling? I don't think that's possible. I don't either. That's why I'm... Right. This is also, this is just the definition of what is an advertisement, and there's okay. nothing um, says no. in what you have that says you can't have a website or anything like that. I mean, I would say the biggest restriction that you have in the, the substantive requirements around advertising is your, what was 30% rule, which is now 15% rule. So, um, and thinking through, you know, that's going to be what's going to really narrow it down to being probably very few places in which you could advertise. So if somebody's going to have a website, um, you know, and you, you might want to consider, you know, we could look at language about having in there saying something around, um, you know, that a, the licensee may have a website and the board should develop rules with regard to, you know, what what that would say to have on yeah, it the in terms of the rights. And there's certain things that, again, this, this organization recommends in terms of like having something where you have to enter your birth date when you go to sign on and certain things that are on there in terms of you know, location, products that are available, things like that, but not to, didn't allow other things. So picking up on the social media aspects, are we saying through this that it's just totally open? So, I mean, what, for Facebook, for example, I mean, you can own your demographics to do any age. Is that okay? You mean in terms of what you would, so you guys are again talking about the requirements? No, I'm yeah. just looking at what the advertising means. So, I'm a um, cannabis retailer, mm -hmm. and I advertise on social media that's not covered by this. You couldn't if you can't show that less than 15% of your of the audience is going to be under 21. Okay, so if I use their demographic criteria, fine tune it to only individuals over 21, is mm -hmm. that okay? But it would still have to be approved by the cannabis yes. board. Yeah. Questions? Well, I don't know, but I think Facebook is the only social media opportunity that has that type of restriction on it. I don't think you can actually advertise cannabis products on Facebook. You can't. No, but. That's today. Yeah. I think you can target Google AdWords pretty really? precisely. To what did you say? Google AdWords. You know where it says, you know, when you do a Google search, usually the first couple oh. are search terms that come up are ads. Those are typically, you can target those by terms, by people. You know, just take a look at Google AdWords to see if you understand it. Questions on this page? Mm -hmm. All right, let's keep going to the next <coughs> section. New CDE. So, with respect to, to see educational. So, having spent a lot of time looking at different things, like, you know, there's a YouTube um, video of how to use a dab rig. Okay. 
That would be educational or instructional, right? Do we want? Well, we. Yeah, I just. Yes. How could you guarantee that a YouTube video wasn't? Well, I'm saying YouTube. I mean, anybody can post up there. That's. That's their freedom to do it, but what I guess I'm getting at is if a cannabis establishment. Right, I was thinking like in terms of like if a cannabis establishment is, does a, you know, a how-to on how-to. How to use their products. Right, or, or, you know, right. Okay. Yeah. decide that Uncommon Market has the absolute best lunch in Montpelier and I could set up a website dedicated to directing people yeah. to the sandwiches that they have so and they can not do much of anything about we're it. Not, we're not trying to regulate that type of advertising for Uncommon Market. I, I'm just asking a question. I mean, how do you, is that not allowing an opportunity to circumvent the rules by doing testimonials? I, I mean, I think you, there's no way you can regulate that. That's, you know, what's the best form of advertising you can get? Earn media, which is, you know, a reporter writing an article about how great your, your food is or, or whatever you're trying to sell. Or you go into a review site like Yelp, where you get, you know, persons who have used your products, whether they're food or otherwise, you know, doing a review. I mean, people look at that, and I don't think there's, any way we can control third parties? I'm not saying that there is. It's just it's I hadn't really thought about it. But all the issues related to age restriction, I mean, they may not apply to me. I don't work for the campus establishment. How? So what I hear you saying is that you know, that would induce sales. I would think so. Mm -hmm. But the language here says that it's material that is not intended. But this all applies to the cannabis retail or a cannabis establishment. It doesn't apply to the members of the public. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I mean, maybe that's there today of the interest of whatever. We don't have to get sidetracked on it, but if the shoes come you up and other states. Probably do some poking around probably on could. some of those websites that I was referring to. That's yeah. how do you get see what you get that? for advertising. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, C, D, and E, folks. We've got um, talking about signs is attached to the premises. Everybody got to be pre approved. That's right. JP? That was my question. The sign has to be pre approved by the Marijuana Control Board or the local zoning laws? Uh, if you have zoning, that zoning is I don't know if your zoning can. Oh yeah, zoning can restrict signs. Well, they can restrict the size of the sign. Can That's they restrict the content of the sign? Not necessarily. I'm talking size. So, so the so zoning would say you can have a sign at this facility where you could have it and how it could be in a size, not what's on it, but the marijuana control board <coughs> could restrict the content, such as. It would be a symbol such as one of our dispensary has is a very, very small hard mm -hmm. or a bigger, a not, a, you know, not yes. big billboard type thing. And the marijuana control board, board would have that responsibility, is that correct? Yes, they are required to adopt the rules with regard to signage. Okay. So you have, you have Active 50 out there, you have your local whatever your local zoning or bylaws or whatever that would restrict with regard to what you can do for signage and then you have and then you have the board doing it so you got three fabulous layers of regulation yeah. right uh, regulation <laughs> takes to cut through before you can uh, to, <laughs> to, 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 to put your sign up, sign up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, no. 
has to be quick. Science can be regulated down to the color, let alone the verbiage of sound. Okay. Yeah. So, so all what the municipality votes and says they want to have is a sign. Mm -hmm. Because you could have obscene music and so forth. That's why you're allowed to basically control the word verbiage. Changes on page 20. I just thought I should add this because the term is used, and um, this is a definition in current law with regard to uh, some tobacco products. And so I just brought it in there so it's clear and you have that in there because there's a requirement um, for child resistant packaging in your in your what you already have in here, and I just thought it'd be good to drop it. So I'm not changing the definition from current law at all. I just wanted to put a point there so people are clear what it means. Um, page 22, I just added a definition of an integrated licensee. It means a person licensed by the board to engage in the activities of the other five types of licenses. Page 23, uh, that was just striking out because you added the commerce stuff, so resident no longer, we don't need that term any longer because there's no preference for residents. So on advertising, uh, just on the section where you get to the substance for what they can do, mm -hmm. just I put it in there, not necessary because it's in the same chapter, but I just again kind of wanted to do a directional sometimes, a little aids, um, so it has those definitions. And then on subsection B, the earlier the version had said, cannabis establishments shall not advertise via flyer, billboard, whatever. This new definition of advertisement is much more comprehensive, I think, and better. Um, and so I just said any medium. And also, when we, we're, we already have those terms to hook into all those mediums. Um, and then unless the licensee can show that not more than 15% reasonably expected to be under 25, so changing that from 30%. Um, in C, which I know we, there's no highlighted changes there, mm -hmm. uh, I think we've heard testimony about um, pregnant women, uh, pregnant women, or pregnant women, uh, so I just didn't know. We don't have to talk about it now. I just, uh, we were talking about prohibited products, so I, 
light bulb went off. Yeah. Well, that's not a prohibiting, it's just a limiting right. of the size. So right. That's prohibited over five, yeah. if that was true. So for rulemaking, about it, mostly it's about around the integrated. Um, but I did, and the vice chair asked me about this before, about why there wasn't anything specific with regard to wholesalers on the rules. The first subdivision that you have in there in A1 is you have a super long list of things that have to apply to all, they have to develop rules on a number of issues for all licensees. There wasn't anything that had come up either in testimony or in talking to folks around that were, that were having to be specific for wholesalers. But I thought, you know, might as well put one in there so it looks like, it doesn't look as like we forgot about them. And so I just <laughs> put something in saying, rules concerning wholesalers, including provisions the board is not already addressed already in that super long list and that are appropriate for safe regulation of wholesalers in accordance with this chapter. So it's just kind of, something comes up and they think, oh my gosh, this is some unique function that they do that nobody else does, and then we want to create some standards around it and give them some, some room for that. Um, on D, 5D for retailers, this was around, um, I was trying to clarify some language around the idea that when retailers are sending someone out of the store with their products, that those have to be in a child-resistant packaging. Um, so that idea, so like those um, kind of envelopes that are stick together or something, so it could be. We had a couple of child-resistant mm -hmm. packages in here. Right. Yep. I tested. It passed. So the yeah. idea that so because the because the ca the cannabis products have to be in those things, but cannabis does not, and so the idea that when you're kind of walking out of the store, if it's all like in a like something, that then you've got that. So I just added that in there to be clear. Thank you. Uh, so rules for integrated licenses shall include the provisions of, of all of the other ones. So if it applies to a cultivator, it applies to an integrated licensee who is cultivating. If it, if it applies to a product manufacturer on how many milligrams you can have in a product, it's also going to apply to an integrated licensee who's making products. language on subdivision 3A there. So uh, applicants can obtain a maximum of one type of each license um, and they get one location per license. And then subdivision 3B, an applicant and its affiliates that are a dispensary that's registered under, exist under current law um, can obtain one integrated license or a maximum of one of each type of light of the other licenses, but you can't have both. So you could get one integrated license, or you could get decide not to go integrated license. We just want to cultivate and retail, and we want to be out of the product business. We don't want to be a wholesaler or a testing lab, but we want to do these three, two things. So maybe we don't want to pay a fee for an integrated license, so we're going to get a cultivator and a retail. They could do that, but they can't. They, you know, the option for the integrated precludes them from participating in the other licenses. Yes. Well, when we toured the, some of the facilities, all you all through, they pretty much did everything from A to F. Uh, and they cultivated the product, they grew it, they did what they had to do for the testing, they packaged it, they sold it. So they're full-blown all six of these things. 
So they would get an integrated license, is what I'm hearing from here, in order to continue what they're doing. Under a commercial system. So the dispensary, so we're not talking about what they would do under their dispensary license, but if they, if this is the alternative to the temporary license, so the idea of allowing them, because there's only five of them, allowing them to continue to operate as an integrated system under the commercial system under one new license. So they would still have their dispensary license and then they would have an integrated license if they wanted that. It may be that you know, my understanding is that the dispensaries are supportive of the idea of, of the integrated license, but it may be that once everything comes down and you look at the fees and everything, they may say, well, actually, we don't, maybe they don't want to do, you know, have all of those. Um, and so they can opt for individual licenses if they want to. But, the, but they have the option of doing that, so especially when we're looking at early sales, they're basically going to take some of the product and going to sell it. Mm -hmm. now, medical side, the other side, but they have a full functional operations to do that. Right. Right from the get-go. Exactly. And they would be getting, I would assume, an integrated license is what they would do at that point if they were doing all stages of this. Yep. Yep, if that's what they want to do. And that actually brings us, um, let me come back to the PRA stuff and show you the... So for an integrated license, as I already talked about, it allows them to engage in the activities of cultivator, wholesaler, manufacturer, retailer, and testing lab. It's only available to applicants and, um, that hold a dispensary registration as of July 1st, 2020. There should be no more than five. Um, upon compliance with all application procedures and requirements, the board shall issue the license. So grandfathering as long as you get everything in, your application's complete, you're in compliance, you get the license. And the licensee has the right to renew the license in accordance with what's adopted by the board. So that it's not some it is not a temporary license. As long as they go through and they pay their fees and they're in, you know, good standing and in compliance, they would be able to continue in perpetuity to be able to do the integrated license. That's a good point. I should clarify that with regard to the integrated license that it doesn't, you don't have to have your retail oh, necessary the in the same right or right. That's a good point. And then while, and then I'll skip around just again if that's okay. And oh, much I'm so sorry. Just a quick comment that um, Vermont distillers have long wanted a license that would include several different aspects of their business that um, that they're constantly you know required to ask for licensure on so um, maybe our board somewhere down the road will want to look at keeping this integrated well this doesn't go away this will stay okay this will stay for the only for those five entities they may come to you with a recommendation at some point to say hey it's working pretty well and it's actually maybe less work for the board to regulate because they've got you know in terms of all the moving pieces maybe they would recommend to you that you expand the mm -hmm. option for, for integrated licenses um, um, and then i just want to show you the implementation so the way that this would work and now i'll do an updated timeline for you if everybody kind of agrees with the concept so, so the idea is that what would happen is Imagine your board going through rulemaking, having their final rules adopted in December of 2020. Then January 21 rolls around. And at that time in January, you're going to have an application period open up for 
integrated licenses and for cultivators only, those two. And so subsection A is the integrated, and B and then down for cultivators. Um, so for A, so the plant limits, the cannabis limits, and the product possession limits for a dispensary will disappear the septem in September of 2020. So about four months prior to a dispensary being able to apply for an integrated license. So those caps will lift. The idea being that they could start to ramp up to be able to get ready to uh, share with their integrated license for product to do sales. So in January, uh, as of January 15th, they can apply for the integrated license. You have five of them applying. Uh, and then on or before February 15th, the board will begin issuing those licenses. And that a licensee could begin selling cannabis and cannabis products <coughs> immediately. So they wouldn't have been able to cultivate under that new license, but they were able to gear up under the dispensary license, and then they can either transfer or sell products from the dispensary to the uh, integrated licensee, and then they could sell under that permit. So it allows them to, again, you, so you get kind of some some early sales in a sense, but not under a temporary system, not under a different regulatory body. Um, they would be gearing up still under DPS system, but it'd be, you know, they'd be in the process of the getting ready for the transfer. Um, and it would just be lifting the covered caps. So for me, this is what I believe Michelle was talking about as far as wanting to have us give her a sense of direction on this before you go and do. Right, I changed it in most places. Timeline and, and all of the, um, so before we, uh, this, this is uh, a decision point about how to proceed. Um, and this again brings small cultivators in at the same time oh, right. so as dispensaries because it would Yep. have the issuance of those licenses happening at the same time. Right. So, so they, the small cultivators, you would still have the preference for the small cultivators. And then um, and then just clarification that the cultivators can start selling to integrated licensees and dispensaries as soon as they've got product because because the retailers, the new retailers won't be licensed until that July. But if the cultivator got a fast growing strain or something and they can get it up and going and they can get some, some product that they can immediately, as soon as they have product, start selling to dispensaries and integrated licenses. So it gives them a little boost at the Uh, I may have missed this somewhere along the way, but how do we know that all five dispensaries are committed to doing retail sales? Do we know that? I don't think that's anecdotal. I think if you want to, you should hear it probably directly from them. Because if that's not it, <laughs> <laughs> take it out in the hall. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I'm just wondering because if that wasn't yeah. the case, then what? Yeah. Then we would not have retail product until the other retail establishments go online. That's but it would still give okay. preference to small cultivators to begin to plan for either I'm getting my plants in the ground as soon as last frost or, mm -hmm. or whatever their preferred method of growing is. No, that's the fun part. I was just thinking. Mm -hmm. So, committee, do we feel comfortable with this, uh, with giving the green light on this change? Speak now. Mm -hmm. All right. Jim's thumbs are busy. 
<laughs> Good job, Rob. <laughs> you just you just agreed that you were uh, paying for breakfast on Friday morning. With respect to small cultivators, um, that one I think actually I need to update. That's from the last when there were temporary sales, but I might, I'll look at the timeline. I might tweak that to just again kind of make it clear that small cultivators, I don't know, I don't know, maybe it won't matter there, but they can basically, as soon as they're licensed, whoever is licensed at the time. Cultivators is that February 21? Yep, that's if you look just above there. Is their application? They're applying January and 21. And they'll issue the licenses in February. Yep, on or you know, just as fast. You know, it could be that they're they got a handle on it. And can, they can start issuing them, you know, as soon as possible. The dates are uh, you must start at least by now. So okay. It's a kind of they okay. can start as soon as possible. So if they're ready to go, they've got So they can be January. Absolutely. Also. Yeah, they can be immediately. Yeah, the cultivators and the integrated are the same timeline. Um, the issue is that if you don't let the integrated go be at least at the same. When you put the cultivators in front of everybody, they're not going to have anybody to sell to. <laughs> so, right. um, and that's it for this 
stuff. Uh, you know, down at the bottom we have the, you know, we're not talking about the medical for now, um, but the issues around, um, um, I put in your new language on your, on your new fund. <coughs> So what you'll see there is that the fund will be created this year, and then I changed the date so that because you'll see some revenue coming in, in you know somewhere between January and July of, of 21, which will be FY22, you know I'm changing so that this language that you see in Section 18B that will start to apply as of January 1st in 21. So you'll start to see some of the money going to that fund in the second half of FY22. Um, on the Ag Lab, I just changed the terminology because it was from 117, which uses the term marijuana because it's working in the in the medical, in the medical chapter. So I just changed the cannabis. But other than that, that's the same. Um, I also, in subsection C, um, added that so to contemplate that because this section goes into effect this July. So it could be that right now, until while DPS is regulating the dispensaries, if they want to do compliance testing, they pay the ad lab. And then once it shifts over, it'll be the board. have your language to decide about section for sections 20A, um, which is the food establishment, and then 20B, which human I mean, um, health care is taking up this afternoon um, to talk about that. And, and that's it, other than I've just been tweaking as we make decisions, just changing the effect. about the rollout of what they're doing for hemp and knowing that they're ramping up their inspection um, staffing and their testing staffing and then looking at the timeline that we're looking at there certainly would be time for us next year to, to do a deeper dive into this and say okay does the ag agency have experience doing this because they've been doing it for CBD products for the last however many months, or do we want to take a, a closer look at at how we slice it? So I, I guess I'm going to say that I'm comfortable with this right now, but I'm going to keep it in the back of my head as something that we want to possibly come back to next year once we know more about the landscape. So are you saying that you don't you really need Section 20 in this legislation? That you would be considered later or? So the underlying language um, precludes them from being considered 
the Canada, or considered a food manufacturing establishment mm -hmm. for the purposes of the Department of Health. Mm -hmm. So, right, they want the exemption. If you take the exemption out, then I would interpret that as meaning you do want it. Although, so they could argue it's vague, but since it's been considered here and discussed, take it out. But then you could, but as you said, it's going to be, um, it's going to be a little time, so you could take action next year. The only thing that I would um, just add to the mix for your consideration is about when the board is adopting rules with regard to health and safety requirements and sanitary requirements and things like that, do you want them to have clear direction about whether or not the health department is involved with product manufacturers as a, regu as a regulator as well? Um, does that make sense? Uh, well, I guess they would, they would consult on the rulemaking, right? Because, I mean, it, this is exempting health from having to mm -hmm. examine cannabis products. So all they could do is consult on the rules. Establishments that can, that produce cannabis products. Yeah. Right. I mean, what we've been trying to get to is the inspection of the establishment, mm -hmm. not the testing of the product. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that that has been the rub. Jim and then Bob. So I'm going to assume the CPSA is in the health statutes yes. as opposed to ag. Is there something similar in ag that you would add language to? I, I guess my only concern of totally putting it off is it slips through and then going down the road next year, nothing happens. So I'm wondering if Instead of where they exempt themselves, you could say um, which places shall be um, inspected or licensed by the Agency of Agriculture in consultation with the health department. I'm not sure that the law there. You may have to go in the ag section. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, there's a section in the ag with all the, the creamy stands, and, you know, dairy processing, and meat inspection, and Probably eggs are in there, and um, I'm just asking from a. I think we should put something in there. Which we could change. Or, or another option is to leave this in and, and as is and, and put a note there. but I sense some ambiguity from both of the representatives about who had the power to do what in terms of closing down uh, when they found either violations or area of concern. And I sort of think we should stick something in that gives them both the authority to say if we're acting jointly or independently, if there's something funky, I'd be able to say stop right now. Well. And I could have misinterpreted what they were saying, but it seemed like they were doing a lot of punting. I think to Michelle's point, she's concerned that we give direction to the board so that when they're making their rules, they can be clear about which department or agency is going to have jurisdiction. Right. So you're requiring uh, them to adopt rules on, you know, sanit, you know, health and safety and sanitation and things like that for all cannabis establishments. And so when it comes to product manufacturers and their consideration of that, I think they might want to know or have clear guidance at that time. Well, 
maybe part of the rules is you have to be in compliance with the DOH's requirements for food manufacturing establishments, you know, or you know, you feel like that that's part of a requirement of your product manufacturer license. Um, and I'm sorry, I wasn't here for most of the discussion about um, between these two. I would say I, my, my general bias is, is just about being a little concerned that involving too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, it's hard sometimes with the cannabis issue. I avoid a number of uh, pun traps. Yes. Um, but uh, I just mean, I don't know, do they really have it sorted out? No, I, I mean, so I would say just be cautious about building a new system on top of something that isn't sorted out yet. Mm -hmm. That's why I was suggesting that we will know more a year from now. No, I mean, won't. I could put some kind of placeholder in and have somebody come back to you on it. And that would, um, that would probably be the trick. You know, we can just, it's, to me it seems like, again, more it should be the board rather than Department of Health in the sense that the board is independent and looking at what makes sense best from the safe regulation up here. I mean, I'm not saying that Department of Health doesn't have people's message, but they've clearly got a position that they don't want to be involved in regulating. Um, uh, so, like in the, in the example that exists now, can Liquor Control Board give the Department of Health authority to do something like we're sort of suggesting here that the Cannabis Control Board would set up parameters by which the Department of Agriculture or the Department of Health could do something under their purview, or are they separate enough that that's just ridiculous to think about? Well, they may have like. had that authority to begin with when they were coming out of prohibition, but well, they may not need that authority now that practices are well established. <laughs> separate. Going yeah. back to the ambiguity yeah. of the two sitting here about who had power to do what if either. JP? Michelle, the last few comments she made are, I think, right on. Um, I was going to comment on some of those, but you've done better than I could on that. Please. But it goes back to the basics, and correct me if I'm wrong, the marijuana control board makes the rules, can set the rules and guidance and restrictions for inspections and all that good stuff. However, I do not believe, I could be wrong, I do not believe that they have the authority <coughs> to direct what the agency does in inspections. Is that, is that, and that's a yes or no question. Does, does the marijuana have, marijuana control board have the authority to direct, and in my case, we're gonna say direct the Department of Health, you shall conduct the inspections, or is that authority given to the legislature to tell the Department of Health, you shall? And, and I understand that the Department of Health is actively fighting against this for whatever reason, and the reason that they specified don't necessarily agree with them, but can't they be told by the legislature, you shall conduct these? And then, and then the uh, board sets the rules and the restrictions and the guidance and all that good stuff. So if that's it, the case, yeah, theoretically. it's up to you. Yes. yes, it's not for the board. I think when, when it is unclear, there is ambiguity, then basically it's going to be left up to those in the different agencies to look at their own statutes and rules and determine, do you fall under our jurisdiction or do you not? So Department of Health's perspective is they would not fall under their jurisdiction and the board couldn't do anything to compel them to inspect. It would be up to you if you want to if you want to require the health department to be doing sanitation inspections of, of commercial kitchens that are producing cannabis products, then you should be explicit about that. Exactly. And the Department of Agriculture on, on the flip side is also saying that we don't really want to do this either. So I think it comes down to the level where the legislature or at least this committee makes a recommend as to who's going to do what. And if it boils down to, to saying the Department of Health is going to do it, then so be it. Kind of harsh, but but still, somebody's got to do it. If we think the inspections are necessary, which I do personally, but 
Um, if we think they're necessary, somebody's got to do it. And if they can't make up their mind who's going to do it, then maybe they need some help to make it up their mind. So maybe some report back language to trigger us to take a deeper dive on this next year? So just having the board come back about whether or not to. I think that kind of fits in um, with the issue. You know, they're going to come back for the for the build out and talking about the you know the second and third years. Is, you know, I think it makes sense. They can come back and say, you know, it makes sense for doesn't make sense. We can cover it. Maybe what they'll ask. Maybe they'll ask for their own public health inspector. You know, as one of their positions right. on the board and not utilize another agency. Maybe that will be their recommendation. But um, I can look at kind of coming up with some language for that and bring some information back to the board. Um, and they will have. Um, they will be at the beginning of their rulemaking stage, so. They can get that information from you, get a sense from where the General Assembly wants to go. They want to kind of go in the direction of having just plugging into the existing system for health department doing those things, or whether they want to take a different path. And then they can consider that when they're looking at their goals. So they wouldn't be in any particular disadvantage to, to just get the can down the road and roll all of it. And, 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 and then that's, and that's, a, you know, that's a good idea, I think. But I, I just think we personally, I think we need to be very clear that we want for, for the public safety aspect of it and getting the products that can stay in and safe products and clean products and prepared properly. We want the inspection to be done and want them done properly and whether they have their own inspector or whatever you're going to do it. But I just think we need to be very clear to say that this is what we want and this is what we expect. So they have, they have very good guidance on how, how to move. There's no question that, well, the legislature is spoken. They want inspection, so I guess we're going to get inspection. And, I, and I'm new here, but that's just the Well, it's about consumer protection, so we will make sure that that gets put in process. Can I just ask one part that, sorry, that I missed with the consumer protection? Um, the so were they saying that the people who are, who are doing CBD products that are making foods or drinks with CBD products, that they are not covered by this now? I believe they said that the ag agency is... Do you know what number is the end production bill? Maybe we should probably take a quick look at that. Is that they reference that? Okay. Or I'll hold you. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's around testing. No, I'm talking about, like, so if somebody is, like, when I'm looking at this definition, I mean, Producing food. Yeah, I mean, the I fact that it has this extra ingredient in it, I don't know yeah, how that then yeah. exempts them from uh, being a food manufacturing establishment. So, but 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 are they? Are, is the Department of Health regulating the people who are are you know making the iced tea at the co that's all of the co-op with the CBD in it? They were regulating it before they started putting CBD in it. Right. So I guess I just don't understand why the addition of CBD, why all of a sudden that exempts them from this. I, I agree with you. I, I find health's position bizarre in some ways. Because what if Pepperidge Farm, Farm decided to open a mega bakery mm -hmm. in the state? Are we going to say, can't do it. We don't have enough bakery inspectors. Even though we want jobs and business to come in here, we can't do it because we don't have enough inspectors. I, I mean, it, it, it seems a little silly. And if you go to Ag's page on Vermont regulations of food safety, it spells out which of the two agencies regulate various products, bakery goods, breads, cookies, health, other, product, other processed food products, such as candy, candies, and popcorn, health. It's just, so, I mean, we can take a look at this hemp production bill and see if it clarifies it, but I don't know. I just find there. I can't imagine the feedback we receive from other food manufacturers 
who have to abide by these very stringent um, guidelines for food safety when, like a brown maker, a cookie maker, and then they say, but the guy across the street who's putting, you know, cannabis in the cookie doesn't have any inspection at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, which is why we want to create a flag so that we can uh, come back to this. Jim? I can't find it, but there's an exemption for a home kitchen below a certain level, $10,000 or something. MS, but, but the health department, I think, still has the ability to shut them down, even though they don't have a license, um, if they, they have a problem. So, it's <laughs> somewhere in here. But, I'm just, you know, as a, as a path forward, you, uh, there's also language in the health department statutes about, you know, if there's a health risk, they have all kinds of power. You know, I suspect if we have a measles, serious measles outbreak, you know, but like New York City, the mayor just says, you're going to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere in our statutes, the health commissioner has the ability to, you know, circumvent religious exemptions. I don't know, but I'm not suggesting that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so committee, um, because we got through the end of the bill, I'm going to suggest that we change, switch gears at this point because I do have um, some of the requested testimony on the AVR language that was removed from 107 when it was on the Senate side. So Michelle, is there anything else that you can think of that you would like direction from us on at this moment? I don't. Oh, uh, I don't think so, but John, if you could send me Thank you very much. Sure. So committee, just to reorient ourselves, we, um, we did some work on S-107 elections corrections. We've had uh, the Secretary of State's office in a couple of times to talk with us about, um, about the expanding automatic voter registration beyond the Department of Motor Vehicles to any departments who might also be collecting the same information that uh, that is required to be collected for voter registration and whether the Secretary of State's office might set up a, an automatic voter registration agreement with other departments. And so we've asked um, ask Candace Morgan to come in and uh, talk with us about the perspective of the Agency of Human Services, which is where I understand the majority of those potential collaborators uh, would be. And so, did Candace, Candace, come on up and join us. Hal's gonna, or uh, Nelson's gonna take a breather, but that's okay. Go right ahead if you need to. I don't have any. So there we go. For the record, uh, Candace Morgan, I'm the principal assistant in the secretary's office at the Agency of Human Services. So thank you for asking us to testify on this language. Um, from the Agency of Human Services perspective, you know, we took a look at the language at the request of the chair at the end of last week, and we did have a brief conversation with Will Senning in the Secretary of State's office. Our understanding of the intent of this language is for us to be able to pursue these opportunities where um, they might make sense for our different agencies, or rather different departments within the agency, and some of the forms that we require Vermonters to submit um, and see whether or not anything might be an option for us to act as a, a voter registration agency. Um, we have not had a chance to really run to ground all of the different places where this might be an option, um, but we plan to work with the Secretary of State's office to talk about what that might look like. Um, so as long as it's something that is authorizing but not requiring us, um, we are comfortable with this language being included. Jim. So the initial language talked about consulting with the various agencies, mm -hmm. but they could still do it even if you didn't think you were ready. Um, 
and my understanding was they were okay with changing it, but I don't know if you've seen a new draft. Do you have something? I don't have a new draft. What I have right now before me is the bill that was, um, the language in the bill is introduced on the Senate side. So I don't have any new language okay. to talk about at this point in time. So I think it was the intention of the committee as mm -hmm. we were discussing it last that we would make this authorizing, not requiring. Yeah. Right. Right, now as we talked about, I just didn't know if there was a new draft that had been shared with us. There is if we will make one. Okay, we would be supportive of that. <coughs> right. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Great. Right. Any other questions? You don't have to make one up, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Eleven minute break. Yeah, we'll make that break. Candace was just dying to have a you know, I know. A good, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, in all seriousness, though, I do appreciate you yes. um, touching base and, uh, yeah. and and getting a feel for yeah. uh, the comfort level of different departments. And uh, we will uh, pursue the language to make sure that it is an authorizing Perfect. sense as opposed to a, a requirement. All right, committee, you've earned yourself a 10 minute break before we come back to Prop 2. Thank the you. Declaration of Rights clarifying the prohibition on slavery and indentured servitude.